Well, um, welcome to um, the Center for South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies uh, lecture series. Uh, today, uh, we will be uh, speaking. Uh, I mean, today our guest speaker will be talking about Kashmir uh, and the resilience of a city. And I think it's Srinagar for the most part. Before, before I introduce him, I'd like to thank our graduate assistants, Fiza Shahzad, who's sitting here, and Namrita Jain for doing the legwork um, to make this event possible. Thank you. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Hakeem Samir Hamdani uh, to talks. Uh, he's Kashmir's uh, leading architect, um, who's interested both in um, architectural history and also in uh, conservation, uh, which is fascinating. Dr. Hamdani is currently a postdoctoral fellow at MIT's Aga Khan program, and he's a graduate um, of the School of Planning and Architecture um, in New Delhi, uh, Delhi, where he did his doctorate, uh, which led to the publication of a fascinating book called Syncretic Traditions of Islamic Religious Architecture of Kashmir, uh, 1320 to 1847, uh, published by Rutledge in, um, I, I think, 2021. In 2004, uh, Dr. Hamdani has been the design director um, Indian National Trust for Art and Culture, Cultural Heritage, uh, uh, the Kashmiri chapter, it's known as INTAP uh, in Srinagar. He's worked on various uh, projects, uh, conservation projects um, in Kashmir, uh, including the construction, reconstruction of the 18th century wooden shrine uh, of Peer Dastgir uh, Sahib, restoration of the Mughal monument of Khar Baba Sahib at Srinagar, conservation of historic Mughal gardens of Kashmir, and conservation of Ali Masjid at Idga, Srinagar. Uh, two of his uh, projects um, have uh, been uh, long listed for Aga Khan Award for Architecture. He's also worked uh, on the conservation of the Khan Kai Shai Hamdan, which I believe is on the image uh, for the flyer um, that was made for this event. With his primary research focused on Islamic architecture, uh, he's published uh, in various journals, uh, books, uh, and, and book chapters. He's working on a book um, currently on Shiism in Kashmir, uh, a history of Sunni Shia rivalry and reconciliation, which will be published by I.B. Torres, uh, and is also co editing a book on Mughal gardens of Kashmir for Intak. Uh, we have uh, become accustomed to associate the word. Kashmir with um, violence and Indo-Pakistan bickering. When I met Dr. Hamdani last semester, um, I immediately asked him how Kashmiris were negotiating their everyday lives and whether he would like to speak to us on the subject. He smiled, hesitated, uh, and didn't think it was possible, but then he agreed. And so I'm delighted that he did. Um, we are very fortunate to have him with us um, uh, to share his experiences, memories, and pain at what his homeland has been going through. Um, so please join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Hamdani to Tux. Thank you, Dr. Zalal. Am I allowed to take it off? Yes, mask? you can. I suppose it's far enough. <laughs> thank you, because this Easy is to follow you. <laughs> so thanks. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, honor to be here with Dr. Jalal. I mean, those of us who are living in Kashmir, I think we all owe uh, the amount of scholarship that is emerged on Kashmir in recent decades. It's because of her work, it's because of her mimicking of people around there and the work that has been produced on Kashmir. So, this is a bit of a disjointed talk, which was primarily, I don't even know what I'm going to say. Secondly, I'm an architect, so I live with a visual image, and this is the first time I'm going to have a PPT with me, so I don't even have an image to look and see and then say, okay, I'm going to talk about it. And um, the reason is, uh, basically, I've never talked about I mean, you do talk about your friends, you do talk to relatives, but the public in the school or the college, I've never talked about this, and that is a part of growing up. Uh, I remember during our college days, uh, we had a professor, Professor Batish Grover, and he used to recite a verse of, I think it is Sahib with one, uh, but I'm, I don't remember the name of the poet, which was something like, Ye Sheher Baste Baste Bazate. It's a Urdu verse which goes something like, these cities come into existence by being lived. 
And the whole history of Kashmir, or the whole history of you know, the place I live in, the city, the principal city of Kashmir, is for the recent past, it is one of the chaos, of pain, and killing. And in between, we are living. I mean, there's a celebration of life there. If you see the physical structure of the city, there's a part of the city which is dilapidated, worn out. There are traces of history all around it. I mean, it's a city, we say it's a 2000 year old city. Maybe not that old, but that layering is quite, uh, it goes for many centuries. But the fact is, in between the decay, you do find the resilience of the people who are continually striving to live. I mean, we are caught in between India and Pakistan, not because of any of our own choices. We are there because of geography, and we are there where we are politically because of the choices that India and Pakistan make. But how does it affect our life? I still, whenever in, late in the night I go on a street, I still feel a bit hesitant if I'm alone. Because, uh, I mean, as a teenager, and again, I'm speaking about South Asia, and I'm speaking about Kashmir, I'm speaking for the wider South Asia. It's in your teenage days that you actually explore your city with your friends, with your relatives. You do something good, something bad, but at least you move into cities. I was in my eighth class when uh, the armed rebellion or revolt against India started. And the first thing that happened that we had to be back home by four o'clock. So four o'clock, after four o'clock, you could not go out on the street. The first time I had an experience of, a, let's say, a nightlife was when I joined my college in Delhi, which is somewhere around uh, 694. And we had a Saturday night party. And on the way back, I was very perturbed because I've never lived that part of life where you are out on the road late in the night. And late in the night, it was around one o'clock. I mean, back home, you could be back at home by four o'clock. How does it affect you? Uh, I never explored the city, the side. I mean, we do some things. So many people come around, Goldberg, Pandam. I mean, these are sort of results in the wider geography of Kashmir. Uh, but not only for me, but for the entire population of Kashmir, these were places you could never go out, out in the 90s. We couldn't even move out of the city. Leave aside the fact that you are experiencing the city. It's only when I finish my undergrad, which is around 99, things had improved a bit. Marketing, I was saying, it improved a bit. Marketing, you could move out. So you have this thing of an eye card. Our whole existence was one eye card. It still is. In my age, the notion that the bus of a student could be stopped on the street and the guards could actually take you in if you don't have an eye card. It has stayed with all of us in Kashmir, even today. I mean, the most precious document that we have is an eye card. And it continues to be so even today. I mean, the thing is, I lost my eye card here at MIT a couple of days back. And I thought, oh, it's going to be a huge issue. How am I going to get it back? Because I know how it happened. Because back home, you need to process it through the police. You need to report it. And the whole thing is a process. I mean, it has its own life, the way you live with that city. So what I was trying to say, it is somewhere around 2000. I came back home and I had a friend, I asked him to go down to the older part of the city. We had migrated from that area in somewhere around 87 when I was a kid. So this is sort of retouching the base of your home life in a way. So we moved in and the first bunker on the first street was where you were stopped and they said, no, you can't go beyond that. And I said, why? We just want to take a couple of images. You couldn't actually take an image of any Hanukkah or a mosque or a table, any building of any significance, because there's a police bunker outside. And the whole thing is, how are you going to prove your bona fides that you are doing it for? Leave aside the question of pleasure or just you want to take a picture of a good structure. It's something that you have to prove that it is of some worth and you are not doing anything which is against the state. So that is a part of growing up in the city. But then we did grow up, and I think we are pretty normal. We did decently enough in our lives, and not only all of us who were there. And that is being aside the fact that there are also people who lost their family members. There are people who were directly affected by the conflict in the sense I had a friend, I still have a friend, I mean, he's still alive. But, uh, uh, he was taken for questioning in the police, by the police, and it was after six months. He was in his 12th standard, which I would assume would be around what, 16, 17, 18 years, somewhere around 18 years old. And he still doesn't speak about what happened to him in the He's grown up, and he's my age, but he doesn't speak about it. He's talking about it, and that's why 
when Prof. Zilla said, uh, we'd like you to talk about your memories of this thing. Uh, you don't need the person. And, uh, but then uh, we live as, um, I would say everyone does live, um, but there are uh, some people who never made it. I'm 45 years old, but in the last couple of years, we have seen the years of being there. Uh, day before yesterday, a couple of days before, in MIT, you have this huge procession of students purchasing the new thing while it's very good. At the moment, even I wanted to join because I felt, I mean, you do get that feel this is something right. Let's join it. But then I thought uh, I'll look a bit off with my white hair among the undergrads there. But just think if you protest, you may lose your eye because of the bullets, because of the pellets. I mean, you can, I can't speak about it. I mean, you just need to look at some of the beautiful kids, young kids, and hundreds have lost their eyesight because they're protesting. I mean, and what are you protesting? Because of the fact that you identify with one thing and not another. I mean, you don't have to go to people, right? so that doesn't mean that, I mean, again, I said this is going to be totally disjointed as I remember things. In 2019, there was a political event that happened in Kashmir, something which is known as the regional autonomy. I mean, it was already diluted, but so what was left was taken away from the city. Okay. Uh, for and I can be wrong with the date everything, but I think for uh, six months, well, we did not have 4G. We did not have a landline for two months. And after the landline was restored, you could only call local people. This is also period where in your SMS service, the basic SMS service was restored after I think 54 or 59. This is this happened in August, and uh, your students, so you know, August is the period when students mostly prepare for scholarship. August is the period when you apply. So I had two colleagues in my office. Uh, they were applying for achievement and for family. Uh, sorry, uh, achievement and plus the one you get there in America. Right. Right. Okay. Right. <coughs> Again, for architects, our portfolio is the most important part. And then the architectural portfolio is a rather very heavy <coughs> file. It's full of images and drawings and colors. So the first thing is you don't have an internet facility. What do you do? Uh, you can't even move out. So the thing is, uh, the government had opened a small uh, press center for the press. The journalists, wherein the journalists could actually upload their daily report because after some uh, report on the news. So then you try to manage a thing within the journalist fraternity, and you can get if you could sort of upload these uh, portfolios and send it across. Uh, now the speed is, I think, two or three G, so they have a limited amount of time. So just imagine there was a room, uh, I think, smaller than this, half this room. There were around six computers on this side, six computers on this side, and there was a huge rush of people because they are journalists. I mean, they have to report, they have to go back to the main news uh, agencies. So you get around half hour, fifteen minutes to half an hour uh, per desk. Now what was happening is that they have to fill in their own news, but then again they. Because this is what I'm talking about, routine, which is basically the people coming together. They are your friends, they are your associates. They would manage it. Uh, and somehow, I don't know how, but the portfolios went through. Now, the next thing is your letter, LOR, your letter of recommendation, and how to send it. And I felt rather uncomfortable going there and waiting in the line. So I called a friend, I gave him my mail, email ID, my password, I told him on phone for a 15 minute call, please write this and just forward it. Luckily, both of them got through. So one got the Commonwealth for a scholarship, another got a full price scholarship. So he's in Georgia Tech as of now. But this is how life is. And it doesn't make, it doesn't matter to the best of the world. I mean, I can't uh, say that there is someone we can blame it for it. But it is the way the world is. I mean, you can't help it. Coming back to Kashmir again, how is life? So in this was 2019, and uh, let me go a bit back to 2010. Uh, as I said, as Professor Jalal said, I work in an NGO, so we get volunteers from across the world who work with us. And so we had a person who came from UK, he was a Belgian, he teaches at the UL these days, so he was a landscape architect, so he was working with us on the Mughal Gardens. He came around, and in 2010, there was a killing, a single killing of a student. Uh, they were protesting about something, I don't even know what the issue was, I don't even remember, 
but I know the name of the painter, so he was killed. So now this uh, gentleman, his name is Jan. Uh, he's, as I said, he's a professor at BU. He told me, uh, uh, basically, uh, we had arranged his accommodation. So I would pick him up in the morning, take him to the office, and on in the evening, he would come with me. So we'd drive together. So first day went, there was a bit of a disturbance because they were taking the procession for the burial was happening. So I told him, uh, Jan, uh, store up some food stuff. He said, why? I said, there's someone has been killed. So maybe said, okay. Um, within a week, I think six kids were again killed in police firing because of the protests that were happening against the killing. So now he also came to know about the news and he told me the uh, chief minister, sort of the like the governor, we have the chief minister down there. So he said, uh, he was more of a very articulate young. He said he was going to resign. I said, why? He said, he was six killing after the way. By the end of it, can be wrong, but I think there were around more than a dozen kills. I think we the case. You are going to get these periods of violence, people get killed, and then again things become normal. And what for us, the people who are living there? I mean, I have a 10-year-old daughter. People have their kids, their children, etc. So you want to live. I mean, you want to manage even within that conflict. I mean, if there's someone that's getting married, so he's going to get married. So there's going to be a wedding, so you're going to wait for the chance where things are rather good, and you're going to spend a good amount of money. That normalcy is also fake. People judge us because of that normalcy. Okay, there is a period there and things are happening. Everything is perfect. But it just takes a minute for that bubble to burst. And it is not because of us, the people who are living there. We have no control over the circumstances of our own existence. And that is the worst thing that could happen to any person, or any people anywhere. Uh, I don't think I'm going to speak much more. I think I would rather prefer if any questions to that. Thank you. I think we can certainly be interactive with you. Uh, but that's already very sort of moving what you've told us. And, you know, when I spoke to you about what happens to live there, one of the things, of course, is the spatial dimensions. I mean, you're an architect and what spatially this conflict uh, has is, is doing to you. I mean, I myself have been to say a few times and I mean, that's what's so striking is the are those bunkers, the, 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 the gun touting young military men uh, with, with, with Kalashnikovs. But the, 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 this idea of space, I mean, you know, how, how, how you manage to sort of negotiate that on an everyday basis. I mean, I mean without, without sort of naturalizing this kind of violence, because it is violence. I mean, uh, once uh, you reduce your uh, level of operation on a certain geography, as I said, I never moved outside the universe. So people who are in that side would be in their own towns and villages. You would move into the city only when you actually absolutely needed to do it. How does this happen? I mean, uh, those of who are aware of South Asian weddings, weddings are the big thing happening in any part of South Asia. And those, normally these are a sort of a night evening event. Uh, we shifted down to the daytime. It looked really bright for us. I mean, weddings in the daytime, the whole amount of people that were gathering the Jews. I mean, these were the things where you were incorporating what was happening in your surroundings in your own life. Again, in terms of the gullies and the hotels, the sort of the neighborhoods. Uh, I mean, they are like uh, somewhere around the 90s, the thing came up, you put barricades on the public road. Basically, what's going to happen there, let's assume there is an encounter between the militants and the armed force on a certain road, the main road. So then the militants are going to run away. And what is going to happen, the armed forces are going to come after them. So they move into neighborhoods and then you don't know what's going to happen. So basically the idea was that you protect the neighborhoods by closing them off. I mean, you're sealing one neighborhood from the other's neighborhood. This was something that was not normal to our way of living. And then these are all experiences about, in the end, it's basically, I mean, you are limited to your own home, your whole interaction, the interactions of those done. But the city was resilient. I mean, in the sense, in the uh, 90s, that's like in the first year we had all this sort of mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, we had again this sort of a blanket uh, bund or hatal, or this is a strike, a general strike by government employees. So government employees would go to the uh, offices, they were protesting the state, and in return they weren't getting any salary. Fine. So what was also happening at that period was that uh, you go to for your tuition, private tuition, the whole students go for their tuition, 
the teachers then should have said, okay, we know they're going to give us this money. Maybe it's going to come one year later down the line, but we are not going to ask for the money and then give education to you. You can't take it a year later, six months later, you will get the money and we'll get it. Same thing that happened with your normal sort of the store, the grocer. I mean, it was wherein uh, it was all based upon a word of honor. Okay, you, you and we are in a similar circumstances. We do accept that you don't have the money, you don't have the financial resources. These are basic needs of that. You need it. You need it. So, okay, take it. We'll manage it. And no one cheated on it. I mean, people paid it. So, this is how it would happen. But again, in terms of the spatial layout of the city, there were routes and roads that you could not pass through. Simply. There were areas which were no longer public areas for you. A part of the city, a part of the whole geography of the region was not yours. It was aided to you. At another level, with all this uh, spatial changes, I mean, the community bonds have been strengthened. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of Vahid, the collaborator, a novelist, telling us about how people in Kashmir are accustomed to stocking food. And so we can go, he said, for many months without food, and we help each other. I mean, people help each other. So, I mean, I think that that kind of community bonding is going to take you far. That's still happening. I mean, again, I would say 2019, we were closed down for around six months. And this time it was also closed down in terms of communication. The earlier ones were wherein the people are protesting against the state. So they are not sort of participating in any activity. But this was something wherein the state is forcing it down. We survived. I mean, the first memory I have of this conflict in terms of the what uh, uh, I share the process I'm saying is somewhere in again mid 1990, 91. Uh, within each neighborhood, the answers were coming start collecting food. So it was a sort of a food collection. Because basically, for food, you need food to survive. Less you can do with, I mean, you, uh, people would be teaching kids at their home. So if there's someone who's a sort of a scientist in a certain neighborhood, all these students who want to teach uh, learn science would go to him. Similarly, for Urdu or math, etc., etc. But food is a basic requirement. I mean, you need to eat something to live for the next day. So there was this whole process where people would actually come, collect food, and then they would distribute it among their community. And this is a sort of a system, this is something we have inherited. In an older times, in the past, you would have these they would make out money from the wages of the people as it is, but at a certain point, they also put in that money that gained that uh, financial wealth into projects of patronage, into projects of civic nature, when the city or the villages were affected. So there could be a plague, it could be a cholera, it could be a flood. I mean, we had a flood in 2015. The state was totally ineffective. It was people who came to each other's cause. Now, the only thing is this is not an organized system. It is organic to a certain locality. And these are sort of organic systems spread all across the city and the villages. But at a certain point, they do sort of Merge together to make the city or the people live across the whole landscape of Kashmir. I don't want to manip, um, uh, monopolize this. Please ask questions. I have several more, but but I I, I do think it should be opened up. Yes, Namrata, please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Speak up a little because the acoustics are not very good. Um, so I wanted to ask how this Kashmir as a space or as a spatial imaginary extend to other parts of the country. Particularly, if I would talk about Delhi, uh, there is a certain uh, ghettoization of the Kashmiri in Delhi, Delhi being the capital. Uh, so I, I want to know from you, how does that uh, pan out or what is the negotiation of, uh, uh, of a Kashmiri? Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, first major movement. Uh, that we had away from Kashmir of youth was somewhere around again outside. When basically you were moving to Bangalore to do your computer education and further on. So it started as a small trickle, but gradually students, it started with the students. So the students started moving to different areas, different cities, mostly Bangalore, then it went down to Chennai, some Delhi, other areas. So the initial part, I would say, uh, in the 90s, and this is again a part where I was also going to get it. I mean, they would call me a Pakistani, though I was not a Pakistani in my college in Delhi, and nothing happened to me. I mean, I think 
uh, I got a bit uh, lighter hand because of the fact that they were calling me Pakistani. I was never Pakistani. I was a bit pro freedom. But... What's worse than being Pakistani? <laughs> anyway. is, is, there, is there something worse than being Pakistani? <laughs> anyway, that's a part. Uh, what I'm trying to say, in the 90s, even India was a different country. I mean, I don't understand it. We have works in, uh, from our college friends, and these are friends I grew up with in the 90s. They were as good or as I am. But now, I mean, they've sort of totally changed this whole idea of India. What does India stand aside from? Leave aside Kashmir. I mean, Kashmir is something on the periphery for both India and Pakistan. But what does India mean for the people of India? I mean, how do they imagine India? Leave aside Kashmir. There is a certain, uh, certain change. I don't question the fact that you, as a Hindu, have a certain amount of pride in your past. Well and good. I'm a Muslim. I have a certain amount of pride in your past. Why can't the Hindu have it or the Christian, whatever be the reason, even an atheist. But the fact that the othering of the other communities, I mean, it is so visible all across India. It's visible in the courts, it's visible in the judiciary, the politics, uh, the, the journalists. I mean, where isn't it there? There are so few good people who are speaking against it. That's what we're reading about it. So the question of how did Kashmiris negotiate their way in the way? In the 90s, I would say, they're still with this. And um, it depends who, I mean, if you want to go to a pub, you would go, if you don't want to go, you don't go. I mean, it depends upon the person who was coming from Kashmir, but it was pretty open to Kashmiris as a people. Uh, but now, it has changed. I mean, uh, you had a fire slot against Kashmiris food and for what? I mean, cheering for a team. And so what? Big deal. But this is what India has done. So the question is, where is Kashmir as an issue? And that passes me because I'm from that area. But generally, I would say it is what has happened to India as an issue, which is a bigger word. I have uh, two interrelated questions. Please, for the recording. Uh, I'm Shaheen Pirzada. I'm just a resident of Cambridge, and I've been here a very long time. My ancestors were from Kashmir just like Madam Aisha Jalal's work. So uh, my both questions are interrelated. Uh, the first one is that, uh, is there special religious persecution also of Kashmiris, like in the mosques and everything? And how are the relations affected between Muslims and non-Muslims in Kashmir these days? And the second part of the question is, where do the politicians stand at this time? I know they don't have any power. My program is perhaps under house arrest already. Or, so so the these are the two questions. I just wanted to do this question and answer in this yeah. session because I don't like to get into politics. But because you asked, let me try to answer it as best I can. I think the Indian state uh, doesn't have a policy against Muslims per se, even in Kashmir. They're not against the religion till now. It is only when they see that your Muslimness is something that can help you in arising against the Indian state that they have heard. So uh, as of now, I would say Jamia Majid was closed if, uh, for 56 Fridays or something. I, I might be wrong on that, but you can just Google it up, Jamia Majid. They opened, uh, the first prayer they had, the Juma prayer they had was last week. So it is when that religious site becomes a symbol of your resistance or your identity your Kashmiri identity, then it becomes a cost for Indian state to go, go against it. Otherwise, I wouldn't say they would be against it first, simply because it is a Muslim faith of worship. Uh, I have worked on projects, conservation projects, involving Muslim places of worship, and the money is coming from the Indian government. One of the projects I was doing before I came here, which is the Hazrat Bar Shrine, which is one of the uh, main religious sites in Kashmir. We were doing a project for Prasad, and I'm personally, uh, went to the Ministry of Tourism, got the project approved, and at that point, we had the largest uh, allocation of financial under that scheme for any site, which was for Srinagar, for the Srinagar site. So it was not a question. Uh, I mean, even given the fact that there's a BJP government and they have a different way of looking at what India is, but generally, I would say the tendency is that uh, uh, they are not against religion per se, or a certain face of religion. What they call the Sufi Islam. I mean, I don't even understand how they uh, want to say it. But uh, a political religion, even if it's uh, Islam, does not matter for the Indian state. You have army, which is basically uh, fighting certain affairs or certain states. 
religious sanctuary at Kashmir. So it happens. I mean, it's only when the religious sanctuary is the point of resistance is the point of view. Kashmiri identity as a state opposed to the Indian identity or the Indian state, that it becomes an issue for the Indian state. I think that is exactly the same. Question about the politicians. Another question is that it shows what the politicians are there for. I mean, these are made with Indian politicians. They were they're welded and they're wedded to the idea of India. The question is that you India have that, which apparently is not in the direction. Question is there are many people who question Sheikh Mohammed the whole idea of accession to India. But there are two points. Either he, the way which is the sort of prevailing narrative that he sort of debates people to do, or that you could also see it in a way that it was a ideological decision on his part. That he may even have to go against the trend of the South in the West of the South Asia and he sees it India. But that was his, if I, I can say this way, faith in an Indian constitution in an Indian republic. And as we see, I fear that republic is no longer there. It's my opinion, I can be totally wrong. Yeah, I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate more on your expertise in architecture and, and blend this in history. And I'll, I guess one particular angle is to think about the relationship between the sacred and architecture, the sacredness and spaces. And I was wondering if you could expand on that as well as in your book, you talk about monumental and vernacular architecture. I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on that. Yeah, so, I mean, the whole idea about my book was basically explaining the fact that is there something as a Kashmiri identity and which we can approach not through any textual history, but through the material history of that place. And I would again say, uh, maybe I'm a bit biased as an architect in favor of buildings, but the buildings are there in your face more than anything else. I mean, what does it speak about? Is there a certain amount of a continuity in terms of the architectural identity we have? And if you see, and this was the part where the National Tech, have got a PPT and I could have shown it, but examine a mosque which is anywhere in South Asia. And examine a mosque which is located in Kashmir. You can just Google it. The peculiarities of the Kashmiri mosque are soon shooted to that land, which speak about a certain Kashmiri ness associated with faith. So I'll say, uh, as Muslims, we are Kashmiri Muslims. And that Kashmiri part is rather very important. Again, I'll say this is similar to those. If you see a Kashmiri mosque, it is so similar to Kashmir. So, I mean, if you see in terms of the architectural history, so we have the school colonial narrative wherein you bifurcate history in terms of the Hindu period, the Muslim period, and apparently there's no continuity between two because that then say these are two different antagonistic uh, cultures or civilization, and they never meld. But if you see architecture, and I would say Kashmir is a good example of it, you see that visual stylistic continuity. And why does it happen? I mean, let's assume that. You are a Hindu and you're building as a Hindu. All of a sudden, it has changed, and there are Muslims in that area. Do you want to stand out or do you want to merge? And how does architecture manifest in that point? If the architecture shows continuity, but that, is, that speaks something about the culture, doesn't it? Why do you want to merge? Why don't you want to stand out and say, This is a superior phase, this is a different phase, because I'm Muslim, therefore I'm going to be there? Overall, I'd say that the sixth architecture of Kashmir by itself is an important, important pointer and indicator of a native Kashmiri identity, uh, which is, I would say, what is all about Kashmir. I mean, again, talking about Kashmir, generally, you'd say if it's an issue of Muslims versus Hindus, then yeah, Mughals were Muslims, right? And as of now, they're getting rather bad press in India. So, uh, if you see, uh, Mughals built a couple of mosques in Kashmir. None of them have been actually used by the Kashmiri Muslims. Why? Because there was a sense of distance between Delhi and Kashmir, even at that period. So whether you're talking about as a regional identity, whatever you may call it, there is that sense of Kashmiri geography, Kashmiri identity, which never even opened to the Mughals, in spite of the fact that they were also Muslims and they were building these mosques for the Muslim community. I mean, even today, there are two major mosques within the city, Pachar Masjid and Mullah Masjid, mostly up in 
it doesn't happen otherwise. I mean, we would have been probably, probably accepted that. So if architecture is something to indicate where Kashmir is located and how its relation has been with mainland South Asia, that would be an important indicator. I have a follow up on this. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that we're hearing consistently is India's settler colonialism um, in, in, in Kashmir uh, and the possibilities uh, that that opens up for India and Indian investments. But we also know from history that, that um, investments typically go to areas um, where there is relative peace and, 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 and you know, uh, certainly not conflict of the kind that Kashmir has witnessed. My question, I guess, is, is, is double. Uh, one is whether um, Kashmir, you, whether you see Kashmir going in this direction, um, I mean, in, in, in a sense, the Palestine direction, the, the settler colonial pattern. Um, because, you know, you've titled your talk as resilience rather than resistance. And it seems that resilience is acceptable, but not resistance. But I want to ask you about what your thoughts are on the settler colonial model as its, and its applicability to Kashmir um, uh, uh, in, in, in the first place, and what that will mean from an architectural spatial point of view. I mean, if someone would have asked me in 90s or maybe even in early 2000s whether Kashmir would lose its autonomy, I would have felt it's not possible. 2009 was never going to happen. I mean, it was something we never thought it would happen. But it happened. So in case the Indian state wants to do it, it happened. Let's be honest about the fact that generally there's this supposition that the state, Indian state is a very soft state. It is not. If they want to do it, they can do it. Uh, the whole idea about, uh, I mean, this is sort of taking from your question that because uh, mining is going to come in or whatever is happening. See, uh, you're quite correct in the fact that it's business. I mean, you're not going to put your money in a national cause or any cause just because you want to make a political statement. In the end, you're a businessman, you want to earn a profit. In Kashmir, prior to nine, uh, this, uh, 2009, uh, we had Sheraton, Hotel, we had Lalit, we had all the major hotel branches that are in India, in Kashmir. This was before 370 was removed. Why? Because it made some business sense for them to operate. After 370 was removed, not one single photo has expanded. They were investing when they thought there was a return because tourism was there. They had invested in it. So you had Moria Sheraton, you had uh, all the other good hotels that were in India. They were there before 370. So the question of business of investment in person. Why am I going to put money somewhere? I mean, there's this uh, uh, recent news about the mall that someone from Dubai is going to put up. And it's supposed to be about in billions of dollars. First, it doesn't fit in with the local economy. I mean, you have to see the nature of the local economy. Does it fit in? Where does it fit in? Where do you work? What is the sort of the workable, doable model that you could use? Secondly, again, in terms of this whole idea about land, yes, it's a possibility. Um, I would say you should not discount it. And it's not something that's going to happen in a year. It can happen a decade down the line. It doesn't have to be so in your face that you react. It can be done in a more subtler manner. Already there's been some amount of land that's been taken and given to hospitals, to schools, but a larger chunk is going to the security agency. So it's happening. So I would say don't discount the possibility. It depends again. The whole question is it's not Kashmir centric, it depends on what's going to happen to India. And it depends upon the term that India takes rather than what Kashmir wants. Thank you. Thank you. It's good. We have a question from Satkin Hamra online, and she's asking Can you please discuss how space is negotiated between Sunnis and Shias in Kashmir today? Huh. Now, this is the topic of my book. <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. So, uh, is there. <laughs> yeah, question is there. How it is negotiated. Mm -hmm. But conflict and reconciliation, maybe you can talk yeah, with. Yeah. I was thinking about it. Where do I pick it up? I mean, where do I pick the thread of <laughs> an answer? So let me put it this way What is the major manifestation of a Shia ness in any culture? It is the Mohram Ashura, the Mohram procession. Historically, in 
uh, Kashmir, it would pass through the heart of the city. And by heart, I mean so numerically. So it would start from the heart of the business district, which is a large job, uh, moved down almost seven, eight kilometers in the older, denser, so near the heart end of the city, and then culminate at the Shia Imam Bada, which was more on the suburbs of the older city. Uh, since to, uh, since 1999, that procession has been done. There are more uh, uh, processions happen, but these are now li uh, limited to inner Shia area. And this is coming from the state. This is not something that the, uh, the processions were attacked, and as a consequence, they were stopped. So, uh, to a certain extent, this is a certain, there's a certain degree of ghettoization happening. And again, it's not directly linked to all to Shia Sunnis. It's basically when you're growing up in the 90s and you find uh, the perception is of lack of security you tend to flock together. So if I'm there, I will go where my cousins are living, my second cousins are living. I mean, it's a certain clannish behavior. And for me as a Shia, it's going to be a Shia. So I would say that there have been these pockets of Shia concentration that have come up in the 90s. The city was uh, going to expand anyway, because that's part of the urban morphology of the city. You would have this migration. It started as a trickle in the 80s, but because of the fact that you have these two events intervening. So you had the militancy, you had this sort of lack of security, the lack of the notion of being secure. So people started moving where your cousins or second cousins or neighbors were moving. So that in a way has resulted in a pattern of the city where you can say there, it's almost sort of divided in a sectarian line. But this divide is not actual in terms of, uh, it's not a clear-cut divide. It's basically, you can negotiate between the boundaries. The boundaries are not present. But then again, there's also a question about the debates uh, that are happening and which are not originating from Kashmir, but you have the failure of the Arab Spring and it has sad relations to a certain degree. Because I'll generally say this, Shias have been supportive of Iran no matter what they do. They bombs, but they will see the uh, threat to the crimes. Similarly, for the other community, I mean, they would say, see the is a case point, but not about Iraq or Yemen. So the question is, there are these this are happenings and events which are happening on the wider Islamic world, but they're having the effect on Kashmir also. But what it's mostly but visible in the social media because, let me put it this way, if there was a debate, a similar thing happening, let's say 20 years back, 30 years back, it would be managed by the elders. But now, I mean, everyone has a mobile. You make a comment, and I'm not going to think about it. Everyone is seeing, so um, I mean, they have the possibility of replying, and they're going to reply in any manner whatsoever. So many attempts. The issues that come up are because of the hot elements, if I could say that way. But you can't control that. It's happening there. So I would say uh, relations are decent. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. There's not a sheer any problem in Kashmir. So I mean, I don't know. So why are you writing about it? I'm writing it in the 19th century. So I'm starting with the pick of the 19th century. I'm coming to <laughs> something different in the 20th century. I don't know when it's going to end. So, but why? But why are you writing it if it's not a problem? It's not a question of a problem, but it's a question that it was a problem. Okay. And it can always arise again. I mean, the whole idea, I mean, I never talked about the fact that there are Kashmiri pundits who are left Kashmir. And that's also part of the whole conflict of this. So we, I mean, in the sense, it's basically, this is such a small geography. So in all your identity, there's so many multiple identities. You're a Kashmiri, but then you're a Kashmiri pundit. You're a Kashmiri, but you're a Kashmiri Muslim. You're a Kashmiri Muslim, but you can be a Kashmiri Shia Muslim or a Sunni Muslim. And there's an urban rural divide. So all these things are happening within such a smaller geography. The issues of these multiple identities are multiplied. I mean, the uh, issues in terms of the conflict points that can arise. Up. So the whole idea is that it's a point of the past. It has happened. But how did you articulate a certain reconciliation? And is that reconciliation under threat? Is there a possibility that it can again break down? And I would again say it doesn't have to be something that is uh, internal to Kashmir. The events in the wider vicinity, let's say in Pakistan or further in Iraq or Syria, can have an effect and can, I mean, things can sort of fall apart. That's always a possibility. And then again, there's a question of the certain uh, change in the mood of the Sunni community. So primarily, it's a Hanafi uh, matter. But now, 
since the 90s, there has been a tendency towards the Salafis, towards the al Hadiths. And there are other reasons, I and mean, it's not all to do with religion per se, there is caste, the social, so societal issues, uh, why something is coming up, why, how they are interacting, uh, the question of exploitation by the Khan caste system of the Sufis. I mean, all these things are there, so there are reactions. So, I mean, uh, that's also part of the Kashmiri society, a certain uh, emerging religious and people will find reasons to fight um, uh, uh, anywhere. But, but, but what I think that what I'm hearing from you is, is that there is no Shia Sunni problem as such, despite the global dimension that Sadgin's asking about, the impact of global, uh, you know, or rather regional problems, Iran, Iraq war, and that's what she's interested in. In Pakistan, too. Uh, I've always believed that there is no Shia Sunni problem, but as far as the world is concerned, it is, because basically it's a playground of the extension of Iran, Iraq in Pakistan. But you say, but, but somehow Kashmir has not come into that realm I mean, yet. I remember they, for yesterday there was someone, uh, a student who tweeted about something that I think about Pakistan, that the Sunnis do not partake of the food offering that the Shia Mekan put. And she generalized it in South Asia. So we don't take for that as a good question. I said, I actually live in South Asia. Please, we have never seen it. Maybe it's happening in certain areas, but still, it's not a part of our society. I mean, they are I not. Mean, aware of the fact that you are a Shia or you are a Sunni. We're not aware of that. But that doesn't generate a conflict so far. My whole point is. What percentage is Shia do you have? I mean, I would say it's gathering around 5 to 10 percent. But Pakistan has 20 percent Shias, and they are very influential. Minority and and so there is a view that there is a Shia Sunni problem everywhere and Pakistan included, but it's really more in the imagination of people. Uh, and and yes, there are militant groups who go and sort of kill Shias and Shia and, and Sunni who go and kill. I mean, during the period of the militancy, the entirety of nineties. <laughs> But given the events happening around, it can always be manipulated in the situation. It's always a possibility. Thank you. That's really very useful. Anybody else? You got it? Um, let me take you back to your identity as an architect and as uh, an architectural historian. Uh, and uh, a little while ago, you were emphasizing uh, Kashmir's regional identity, and uh, you see a certain continuity in architectural styles. And um, where do you find the origins of this uh, identity in architecture? Is it in the period which you covered in your book from the 14th to the 16th centuries? Is that the era of the Kashmir Sultanate when you also have the flowering of uh, Kashmiri language and literature by devotional preachers of that time, Lal Ded, Sheikh Nuruddin, and so on. And, uh, and then I wondered, I mean, you uh, also pointed to the disjunction between what Delhi, even in the era of the Mughals, provided. The, uh, the mosques are, are not especially attractive to Kashmiri Muslims. But is there any contribution that the Mughals made to this? To, to the space that you study. And I mean, we constantly hear of the Mughal gardens, for example. So uh, as somebody who's interested in conservation, you know, how do you then deal with the contribution of the, uh, of the Mughals? And finally, also staying with uh, these uh, sacred spaces, um, do you think that uh, the old shrines and tombs of the 14th to the 16th century are less connected with contemporary politics uh, or, uh, uh, you know, th there are certain spaces which are venues for the expression of political resistance, including regional Kashmiri resistance. Hazrat Bal, of course, going back to 1931 and then again in the early 1990s. And then, as you mentioned, the Jama Masjid, uh, but again, of course, it goes back to an earlier period. But that is the space where, as you were pointing out, 
uh, until last Friday, there were no Juma prayers uh, since probably August uh, 2019. So how do you as an architect and uh, somebody who's interested in conserving sort of old sort of heritage also address these spaces, which are almost inevitably uh, arenas for the articulation of regional identity, all right, but in the, in the mode of political resistance against central state authority. That's really nice that you put. So let me start with the most so that's an easier one for me. Uh, there's a book by Sunil Shabla, again, he's a <clears> professor <throat> at Boston University, particular languages, Mughal Arcadia. Um, so now it, it, it speaks about the entirety of Mughal relation with Kashmir, which is there is the celebration of Bagh. The Mughals actually celebrated Kashmir as a Bagh. So in terms of their Qasidas, in terms of their Masnavis, you find them repeatedly in the whole idea of Kashmir as heaven, as paradise. They also sort of celebrated and perpetuated this legacy of a paradise through the creation of Kashmir architectural models, whether these are mosques or the gardens, as you said, the Mughal gardens. But if you see any of the Mughal narrative, it's totally empty of any Kashmiri reference. It seemed to be a land, a heaven, which is unpopulated heaven. It is only for the enjoyment of the Mughals. So that has been the sort of the trajectory relation between Delhi and Singer since, I would say, 1386, wherein Delhi sees Kashmir as a perpetual heaven, the piece of geography which you celebrate. And that's something that's never happened in today. I mean, after the taking away of the article, the Indian state does celebrate go to Kashmir as a paradise on earth. This notion of Kashmir as a paradise is celebrated even today by the Indian state. What about the people? So if you see any of the references to Kashmir and the Mughal Tariqs and the Tazkaras, they're quite uh, derogated, to be honest. So that leaves aside the fact, but again, as an architect, as a conservationist, these are masterpieces of human creation. And these are a part of our human legacy. And so we have tried, and I mean, I've been a part of that project also in conserving. I mean, I'd say that the Mughal Gardens, we have the largest amount of surviving Mughal Gardens in South Asia. Six Mughal Gardens of Kashmir are on the UNESCO tentative. Uh, World Heritage Site. Uh, uh, the question of a Kashmiri identity, does it come into force during the Muslim period? No. I mean, there is this American study, Andrew Wink. So, I mean, there's this phenomenon of how Islam came about in the Bengal, and this is something that's been widely written about by uh, Richard Eaton. So, this Andrew Wink came with this theory of the English model. Now, as a part of this, the only difference is that in this entire geography around the uh, uh, Indus, Kashmir is an already established civilization even before the coming of Muslims. So what are the origins of Muslim, oh sorry, uh, architecture of Kashmir? I mean, it doesn't have an origin in the sense it doesn't come from one single place. If you see every look, uh, location and the geography of Kashmir, it's in the mountain. So throughout this history, there have been periods when Kashmir has sort of uh, Translated itself from the uh, age of the West. But it's also again on an important transit route, which is connecting the Central Asia to South Asia. It has always been a part of the wider empires coming from down south to west. So we were a part of the Gandhara, and the Gandhara's whole uh, uh, architectural legacy to the Greek, etc., etc. We were a part of the Mauryan Empire coming down from south. So basically, what is unique about Kashmir is not its originality. There's nothing which is only coming from Kashmir. It's basically the process of selection. So there are these different forms, different motifs coming from different cultures, which you within that geography have selected. And then that unit that comes up, that is unique to Kashmir. So it is originality in terms of the selection that is done. And it is not something that comes to the Muslim, it is there before. <laughs> There's a Sanskrit poet by the name of my maybe getting the name wrong. Uh, Bilhana, sorry, Bilhana. So Bilhana's ancestors are from mainland India. Maybe somewhere from Madhya Pradesh, they come, they settle down in Kashmir. So he's part of that uh, Sanskrit world. And this is sort of uh, uh, pre Muslim rule. He settles out in Kashmir. His uh, uh, parents or grandparents settle down in Kashmir. Then, you know, a generation or two. Sometime later in his life, Belhana moves down back to South Asia. Now, at that point, 
he remembers Kashmir as his home. So it's not Kashmir in a way, it's not an identity that is articulated in terms of your racial uh, as a race. It is the geography. So again, coming back to the point of uh, where does it start? I would say it starts as the uh, architecture of that time starts coming. You mentioned earlier, like in just passing about Kashmiri pundits and sort of leaving. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Don't mind. No, no, no. Well, I mean, uh, no, let me put it this way. Uh, I, as I said, I was in my, I was how many, how many years old? Maybe 13 years old when militancy started in Kashmir. And all the, uh, it was November, and our schools closed down because we have a winter break for three months. Fair, fair, fair. In March, the schools were supposed to open. They never opened. Uh, I think somewhere around mid-April or late April, the schools or May, the schools opened. And in a class of 72, in our school, in my class, half were Hindus and half were Muslim. You only had the Muslims. There was not even a single Hindu student in that class or in that entire school or a Hindu teacher. Uh, you ran out of class at this because these are 90s, I mean, you don't have internet, you don't stay, you are not connected on Facebook or anything. You don't know anything about them. To be very honest, you're caught up in your own life and what is happening in around you. 2000, maybe something around six or seven, one of my friends started this WhatsApp group and he started connecting people. And in somewhere around 2000, I don't exactly remember the date, 11 or 12, we met again. So there was again meeting after 11, how many years? I mean, we were teenagers. We were almost 13 years old when we last met and now we are meeting again. We are grown up and we are with, with our own kids. The whole thing is when, again, initially you try to sort of stay away from the political discourse because you want to connect as friends. But then these things do come, come up. Sometimes it does come up. And one someone who was a Kashmiri pundit friend of mine, he said that he was basically speaking about the sufferings that they had in the Bible. And then he said, we were forced out of Kashmir. Now, as a Muslim, this is something that makes me very uncomfortable because it puts the onus of their violation on me. But then the question is, and I, this is something I've not been able to answer even today. Here he is, he's saying his story. And if he's my friend and he's telling me as a friend that we were forced out, who am I to question him? I mean, forced out by whom? Him? By Jag Mohan or uh, by the Kashmiri Muslim militants? I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is sort of a moral dilemma. I can't answer. But, but, but this is something maybe people across both these sides have to say. I mean, there are their stories and there are our stories. And somehow there's a total disconnect. We, there's no sort of a single thread of narrative which connects their stories to our stories. I don't want to question this. I mean, I don't want to be questioned. I have my memories of my past. I'll, if I'm relating them, I'll just accept that you take it out of my word. Can't I have the same courtesy for this? But then what happens? I'm either with it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't have an answer to that question, to be very honest. And I can't even answer it. Well, I mean, I don't know where your friend grew up, uh, uh, <laughs> but I do think that the Jagmohan, uh, I mean, it's a controversial issue, but I mean, there, there's a very strong view that it was engineered. Uh, so, I mean, you know, it, yes, it was, they were forced, but by whom is the big question mark. But I want to ask you something else. I mean, the impression one gets uh, now that the relations are soured somewhat uh, between Hindus and Muslims in Kashmir, and yet uh, a closer examination of the evidence suggests that many Hindus, uh, pundits included, who have uh, left the valley, um, their homes are being looked after. I mean, their, their orchards are being looked after by Muslim neighbors, something that we never hear about. So I. I do want to hear something about the, that balance. I understand that something was violated with the departure of the pundits. We also know that this has made the problem intractable for all practical purposes because the pundits don't speak with one voice, but they all use the Indian national narrative for their own advantage. But what about this, this, this non-state aspect and, and, and how strong is it? Okay, now. Let me go to my professional career. So somewhere around in 2004, we started an exercise which is basically cultural resource mapping, wherein you're mapping all the historical sites in Sri Lanka city. So we were four people, me and uh, Saima Iqbal, 
Arbutus and and the big so we started going to the young architects especially out of architecture college so it was really interesting because in a way it was also connecting us back to our roots i mean this is as i said i have not been in that part of the city in my entire life and now we're doing a project going uh gully by gully which is sort of street by street in the city we physically documented all these sites so as a part of the exercise we documented something around that we, had that. we actually listed around two to three thousand buildings and out of them five eight hundred are, are part of the national register of historical buildings so you have a reason the certain criteria in which you declare a building as a heritage building now as you went through these studies you also saw mosques you also saw temples and i remember there was a temple uh, at maharaj Gunch. so uh, it was in a building temple but it was in good condition so uh, there was a shopkeeper and he was looking after it and what he was looking basically cleaning it once in a while but it was not defined. I also remember there was a temple, Raghunath temple, which is in Habakadal. Now, that temple had suffered some damages uh, during the immediate period following the militancy. But when I went there, it was sometimes later, I think around 2000 something, and uh, there were a group of kids. And these were basically kids who were taking hashish or opiate, whatever. And they were in a corner of the building and they made a small bonfire where they were sort of burning things, etc. So it was raining a bit. So I thought, uh, I just asked them, you're not going inside the room. It's a temple, you don't go inside. Now these are edicts. Mind you, they are kids. They are maybe teenagers around 12, 13, 14. But they refused to go inside an abundant temple to sort of uh, create their joint and burn some fire there because of the fact that there is this notion of sacredness associated with the temple. That is a part of the country. I mean, it's a part of your blood. We do see these things as sacred spaces. It doesn't go away with this one conflict. Maybe generations later when people no longer, I mean, see, let me put it this way. In my family, I'm the last one who studied in the class of the Kashmiri Pandit. I have nieces who never did. I mean, they might have studied with Hindus outside India or even abroad, but in Kashmir, it's not a normal thing now. So things are changing. I would say things are changing, but still, I would say, the notion of sacredness associated with religious sites still is there. I mean, not only sites, I mean, there are sometimes humorous things. I mean, in Kashmir, we have this, the notion of associating uh, sanctity with a spring. And this is again something that comes from our Hindu past because Kashmiri Hindus were supposed to be Nag worshippers. So the spring is called a Nag. A Nag means a snake. So the presiding deity of a spring is a snake. So that whole notion of sacredness associated with the spring, it's not coming from the Islamic uh, literary uh, religious teaching. It is coming from the Hindu uh, religion, but it's been imbibed by the Muslims for a period of time. And still you would find that uh, people are very careful when they go near to a spring, if it's there. So, I mean, these notions of sacredness are there. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I would say these are narratives and how is it's called up our people. There are people and there are people and there are people. So there's also a possibility someone might have done something wrong, but then that's not a general trend or of a community. Any other questions, anyone? Yes, go ahead. Um, so you brought up, you mentioned your daughter and you mentioned nieces now. Um, so is there like a gender factor in this situation? Like, is there a distinction between the experiences shared by women compared to um, this is a question that I could do now, so I will have a back at the end of it. But yes, I mean, uh, uh, the first me memory you have of the conflict is that of the violation of your home space, that the army can come at any time and enter your home. And secondly, is that whole notion of uh, the sanctity of Parta that you serve as a woman. I mean, as a man, they can be too. And there have been cases of and sexual abuse of women across. As men, you get to, I mean, in those days, at least you could move out. As women, you were far more restricted because the circumstances are not normal. I remember during my school days, so we used to get out on the bus stop and uh, uh, there was a bunker there. So there were two girls uh, from a school, uh, from a school woman ahead of us, and we were sort of following them. Uh, and there was this uh, guy in the bunker and started making cat calls. He couldn't do anything, we can persist. I mean, that is the level of prayer you have. That is us as boys doing that, but you think about that. I mean, I thought you were an answer. Yeah, yeah. 
Any, any other question? Just a short question. Uh, in your answer to uh, Mr. Subhash's question, you said that uh, Kashmir architecture was a fusion even before the Muslims. It was a fusion of different cultures, architecture. Do you think that uh, general architecture in India these days does it have any Islamic influence still, or is it more towards? I didn't get the question. Sorry. I didn't get it. Oh, yes, I I'm not been able to put my question clearly. See, I think I uh, I was at a lecture at the Graduate School of Design, and they said that the houses built in India have to be faced towards the sun or something. Okay. What, okay, okay, that, so that are, is a, Are you talking about Vastu Shastra? Yes, yes. So, uh, how much is the fusion of Islamic I mean, uh, architecture like, and like, Mughal architecture? Like you have uh, Feng Shui. I mean, these are things, these are facts. They come into the, uh, once in a while, they come into the market and people start doing Vastu because apparently it's the in thing. And as architecture for good architecture, you're going to sell it. So <laughs> it's going to, you're going to make some money. But generally, I'd say Indian architecture all across. Uh, there are different trends. So there's some really good, excellent architecture happening. There's again the question. I mean, for uh, most of the architects, the question these days is about sustainability. About living in market. They think something which has a certain meaning and lowers your footprint on the earth itself. So it doesn't have much to do with religion. But yes, because of the fact that India is such a vast and rich geography and a rich culture, there is always a question of context. You're building in a site which is not, let's say, Brooklyn or Boston. So it has a rich uh, contextual uh, site. So how do you build in that? So some people have done both work and that's been being done uh, many years before. Phenomenal work. I mean, it's about architecture generally, but Islam, I would say, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, there are things that uh, Muslims as a culture have a very impact all across India in terms of language, in terms of food, in terms of the way you wear, also in terms of the uh, way you build. And that is a response to the cultural requirements of the faith as well as the local geography. So there are people who are building with those ideas of the wearing of the sport etc. etc. But to associate that with faith per se, I would say it would be wrong. Uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. So what is it that gives you hope? To be honest, I am not a hopeful person. I and think is the, is your feeling shared by people in Kashmir? Not, the whole thing here, this is what we're all talking about. We we grew in the nineties, and that was a totally different generation. It was the part when globalization was happening. It's the part perhaps the Eastern Bloc has sort of gone away. Things were really happy, but now coming to the point where I am today, I would say our only thing is our only not hope, our only dream is to survive. We, our generation left without any hope. We don't assume to hope for a better future. We just hope and pray that we can survive. And there is the next generation, my daughter, and the people who are going to come after them. Maybe they can do something good, but the way we are, I don't see much. But your youth doesn't seem to agree with this narrative. The youth no, are the, 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 the youth are on to something. They're 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 they're, they're sort of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, making music, they're, 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 they're making videos, they're showing their resistance, not just their resilience. But that is phenomenal. I mean, uh, uh, you appreciate it. Uh, that's something that makes you, at the end of the day, feel that even I'm going to survive. But, but what I'm saying that the import of carrying us forward is no longer with my generation, it is with their beliefs, as you said. We are just there left. To survive, and I, mean, I don't know. I think the one hopeful thing that you might want to sort of think about is the Kashmirization of India. <laughs> that might be the only hopeful thing that we have uh, in this scenario. But thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.